bien. Excellent. Agenda item one. Welcome. Dear delegates, council members, guests, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you here, wherever you may be in the world. Good morning, good evening. Of course, it would have been lovely to be together for the second time in a row. But uh, we sincerely hope uh, uh, that next year we'll be able to meet again uh, in person. Because that's uh, very, very important for us, of course. Of course, it's also very important for us to hold uh, this uh, virtual Congress. And I'd like to thank all of you for your collaboration, your support in preparing for and organizing this Congress. Thank you very much for your participation as well. And I can see you up here on the screen, on this giant screen in front of me. And I see that you look OK. So I sincerely hope that you're all doing well. Thank you very much for everything. And on the first agenda item, I'd also like to give the floor to the uh, Swiss president, the president of the Swiss Confederation, Mr. Guy Parmalin. And dear um, FIFA president, uh, dear representatives of the National Football Associations, government representatives, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, it's an honor for me to address you today. I would like to warmly thank uh, your president, Mr. Gianni Infantino, for his kind invitation. The agenda of the 71st FIFA Congress clearly illustrates the range and complexity of the challenges to which FIFA has to rise. You are checking topics that are fundamental to the future of the sport, for football must grow and be accessible to more people. Its positive effects must reach further and wider. Your decisions will have a profound impact because football is the world's most popular sport. There isn't a single town or village without its own stadium, pitch, or at the very least a space to play football. The virtues of football explain its popularity. I will refer to three major ones. Firstly, football is universal. It brings together players, both male and female, from all faiths, classes and regions of the world. Secondly, it can be played everywhere and in a multitude of formats, whether it is one-on-one -on -one or eleven aside. Finally, its laws are followed around the world and are, except possibly the offside law, relatively easy to understand. As with any sport, football teaches us about life and solidarity. It is a good way of promoting education, development and social integration for young people. Unfortunately, in recent months, the beautiful game has not been spared by another global phenomenon, COVID-19. The pandemic has meant that matches have been cancelled and competitions paused in every part of the world. The spectators, who usually electrify the stadiums, suddenly had to stay at home and stadiums have fallen silent without their cheers. In these difficult times, it is essential that we support this sport, which has so much to offer us. I have played, I've been a referee, I still follow it passionately. I therefore speak from experience. I would like to warmly thank FIFA for all the measures it has taken to mitigate the impact of COVID-19 on the national associations, leagues, clubs and players. Thanks to its support, Football can continue to play its part by bringing joy, especially to young people who have been very hard hit by this crisis. Ladies and gentlemen, football has undoubtedly been affected by coronavirus, but will it emerge stronger for it? Nothing will stop the ball from rolling at stadiums, whether there are spectators or not, or in backyards. It will continue to be a beacon of hope for a large section of our society. In fact, for quite some time now, football has been much more than a sport. 
Its social dimension makes it a catalyst for important change, which is why it must be exemplary. I welcome the continued commitment that FIFA has shown to grow and improve the game. President, you will no doubt agree that fair play rules apply on the pitch, but should also be followed by sports federations like yours. Switzerland, which is home to a number of them, is strongly committed to ensuring that this is indeed the case. I therefore applaud the reforms that FIFA has already undertaken and those in the pipeline, especially in relation to governance, transparency, ethics and human rights. Lastly, I am pleased to see the development of women's football. I fully endorse FIFA's objective of promoting the women's game and creating an environment that promotes women in leadership positions. Ladies and gentlemen, FIFA is facing a considerable challenge. It must ensure that the most popular sport on earth flourishes in all its facets and in every corner of the planet. I am certain that you are aware of this and wish you good luck in that endeavor. Dear participants to the Congress, wherever you may be, I extend my warmest regards from Switzerland and wish you a fruitful meeting. Merci. Thank you very much indeed to the President of the Swiss uh, Confederation. Dear Mr. Parlam Parmelin, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to hear you speak to us uh, today. And as you've said uh, very rightly, um, we have major challenges. And uh, FIFA and all of its member associations are working tirelessly to ensure that uh, football is a global sport and uh, supports uh, society as a whole, supports young people, education and development. And uh, it brings uh, joy and hope not only to people in Switzerland, but to people all over the world. We've been based in Switzerland for many years now, and we thank the Confederation and continue to do our best to support uh, young boys and girls to ensure that they can uh, fulfill their dreams, thanks to football. Dear Mr. Parmelin, we'll also try to clarify the um, offside law, of course, a little bit further um, as well. Let's move on to uh, a video address by Mr. Thomas Bach, uh, the IOC president. Dear president of FIFA, my dear IOC colleague and friend Gianni Infantino, dear delegates and friends, when the Olympic Games uh, Tokyo 2020 finally get underway on 23rd of July, it will send a powerful message of solidarity, resilience and hope to the world. These Olympic Games will be a light at the end of the dark tunnel that we are still in because of the coronavirus pandemic. In this respect, football, once again, will play a special role because the Olympic football tournament begins even a few days before this opening ceremony. So football will be sending the very first light at the end of the tunnel from Japan to the billions of people around the world. As you gather for the FIFA Congress in this extraordinary Olympic year, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for demonstrating in a great way that whether in sport or in the many challenges in life, we are always stronger together. This is the lesson that we have learned from the coronavirus crisis. We need more solidarity. More solidarity within societies and more solidarity among societies. This lesson applies to everybody. So it also applies to sport and sports organizations like us. Therefore, your FIFA Congress is a timely opportunity to set the course for the future. 
a future where sport and athletes everywhere can contribute to rebuild a more human-centered and inclusive society. The post-coronavirus world will need this social mission of sport and it will need more solidarity. In this respect, I would like uh, to emphasize the great efforts FIFA has uh, undertaken with their solidarity uh, programs, which are uh, exemplary. And there, my special thanks go uh, to uh, your uh, president, uh, Gianni Infantino, for its great uh, leadership. Our excellent cooperation is a strong foundation as we together and in solidarity continue to pursue our shared mission to put sport at the service of society. In this Olympic spirit, which we share, I wish you fruitful discussions and a successful FIFA Congress 2021. See you in Tokyo. Lieber President des Internationalen Olympischen Komitees. Esteemed President of the International Olympic Committee and dear friend Thomas, thank you very much for your inspiring speech and your positive message here. In this very important Olympic year, of course, and thank you very much for the excellent cooperation within the Olympic movement. As you mentioned, rightfully so, we all go through difficult times. But there's light at the end of the tunnel. Together, in solidarity, we will be able to overcome all the challenges we'll face in sports, in football, and in our societies. Thank you very much, Thomas, for your strong leadership and what you do for the entire sports movement. I'm very much looking forward to seeing you again at the Olympic Games in Tokyo. As you said, it will start with football. Thank you very much. And now we'll see also a message from the president of the Swiss Football Federation, Mr. Dominic Blanc. Mr. President of the FIFA, dear Gianni, dear presidents of the confederations, dear colleagues and delegates, dear guests, dear friends of football. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to welcome you warmly from Switzerland in this virtual Congress on behalf of the Swiss Football Association. Allow me to say that Switzerland has a great love story with our sport. Listen. With its uh, 126 years of existence, the Swiss Football Association is one of the oldest in the world. Switzerland was one, one of the eight members who founded the FIFA in 1904. In Switzerland, we practice a great number of sports. Among them, some are really very popular, like skiing, gymnastic, ice hockey, the sport westing, which is very important in the German part, bicycle, handball, floorball, basketball, etc. However, in spite of this strong competition, or perhaps because of it, football remains the most popular sport in terms of the number of licenses, with 192 different nationalities. In terms of players, spectators around the beach and in the stadiums and media coverage. Organizing this virtual meeting has been a complex job for sure. I would like to thank here the staff of the FIFA for that. But above all, I thank them for the considerable efforts they have made to continue to stay in touch with us, the members. 
that it's vital because in these difficult moments we need to feel the solidarity of the football family. Yes, it has been a very hard time for all of us over the last 14 months. But I would like to spare a thought for the thousands and thousands of clubs in our 211 federations who are struggling to keep their members, to keep their passion, to keep their passion alive in the absence of football and sometimes simply to stay alive. They need us. We need them. We need a broad and solid base. What they are doing with these very little resources is, is absolutely remarkable and deserves to be recognized and supported everywhere with conviction by the authorities and partners concerned. Because football is a great sport on the pitch, but an even, an even greater sport off the pitch. Football is an, uh, an instrument of peace, unity between peoples, social progress and individual and collective success. At the Swiss Football Association, we are convinced that football can be a model for society and an actor of its evolution. Of course, it is inevitable that due to the immense popularity of our sport, we are also showcased in, for example, equal opportunities for all, sustainable development, fundamental human rights. We do accept this with conscience and want to make an active and concrete contribution to these very important themes because they are in harmony with the values that are also ours, those of football. Dear colleagues, I have the honor of addressing you in a common language, that of football, which is understood everywhere throughout the world. We share its universal values. I would like to share with you also our commitment to ensure that football emerge stronger from this global health crisis to continue its missions of sport and public health. Football for all, women and men, everywhere, all the life, integration and social cohesion, success and joy of living. Yes, I did say joy of living with, by and for the football. I thank you very much for your kind attention and, and wish you a good Congress. Thank you very much. Dear President Blanc, dear Dominique, thank you for your kind welcome words for this virtual Congress, but from your country today here in Zurich. Switzerland is indeed amongst the oldest member associations in the world and is a founding member of uh, FIFA and one that has always played an important role for FIFA and for the world of football and should, of course, continue to do so in Europe and around the world. We all have as FIFA an important duty and obligation towards society and all together we need to work in cooperation and solidarity for the future generations. Thank you for what you are doing for football and let's continue working to together to make football truly global. Now, before going to the next agenda item, I would like uh, uh, just to show you a video remembering all those great, great persons who have left us in the last year.
Thank you. I would uh, kindly ask you to um, observe a moment of uh, silence and prayer for all those dear friends who did so much for football and who left us. Thank you so much. And if you'll allow me, I also want to extend greetings to Diego from where he is watching us. Uh, he, already, he always gave us so much emotion and uh, made us love this game uh, so much. He is immortal. Item number two, the roll call and the declaration that the Congress has been convened and composed in compliance with the statutes. So I'm asking the Secretary General to confirm the number of MAs present and entitled to vote. Please, yes, Padma. Agreed, Mr. President. Oh, 07, 207 member association joining us online for today's Congress. I hereby declare that the Congress has been convened and composed in compliance with the FIFA status. I would like to thank each and every one of you for your participation in today's event. Your commitment is testament to your passion and your dedication to football. In the context of exercising voting rights, the Congress was asked to allow the Eritrean National Football Federation to vote at the Congress, despite the fact that this member association did not fulfill the requirement of Article 16, Paragraph 4 of the FIFA Statute. More information on this is visible on your screen now. Accordingly, the Eritrea National Football Federation is entitled to vote at this 71st FIFA Congress. Results have been displayed. Continuing on the topic of voting rights, currently, two member associations are suspended, namely the Pakistan Football Federation and the Chajan Football Association. And therefore, they are not entitled to vote at this FIFA Congress. The situation of these two member associations will be further dealt with under agenda point item number four. Floor back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh... Fatma, so we can move to agenda item number uh, three, the appointment of scrutineers and members to check the minutes. Uh, so I can announce that the Congress was asked to confirm three member associations as scrutineers to examine the functioning of the electronic voting system and five members to check the minutes. Fatma, the floor is all yours. Wait for the result to be displayed. As you can see on your screen, we have received a response from the 209 member association entitled to vote, and we have 208 approving the appointment of the three members as scrutineers to examine the function of the electronic voting system, and five members to check the minute with the following result. Back to you, Mr. President. Thank you um, very much. So we can move to agenda item number four, which is the suspension or expulsion of a member association. Uh, as it was already mentioned by the Secretary General, uh, two associations are currently suspended, Pakistan Football Federation and Chad Chadian Football Association. So we ask the Congress to confirm the suspension of these two member associations. Indeed, Please, Padma. The Congress indeed confirm the suspension of Pakistan Football Federation and the Chadian Football Association. And more information on this is available on screen. This effectively 
reconfirm they are not entitled to vote at this 71st FIFA Congress, nor exercise any membership right. Result show that 203 member association voted in favor of the suspension of Pakistan Football Association and one member association voted no. For Chadian Football Association, 206 member association voted yes for the suspension and one member association voted against the request for suspension. Floor back to you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. So obviously we hope that uh, soon we can lift these suspensions to these two member associations. In the meantime, we move to agenda item five, approval of uh, uh, the agenda. Also there, we ask the Congress uh, members to approve the agenda. Please, Fatma. Result results will be displayed shortly on your screen to confirm that 208 out of 209 member associations entitled to vote have decided to approve the agenda of the 71st FIFA Congress and no member association voted against the motion. So motion passed, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, so the agenda is approved. Uh, we can move to agenda item six, approval of the minutes. Uh, uh, the minutes were checked by uh, the following member associations. You can see them on the screen. Um, Austria, Japan, Senegal, Turks and Caicos Islands, and Uruguay. The Congress was asked to approve uh, the minutes prior to this Congress. Please, Fadma. The Congress has decided to approve the uh, minutes of the 70th FIFA Congress with the following result. Two or five members approved. No member voted against. So motion passed, Mr. President. So, dear friends, we go to the next agenda item, which is the President's address. I hope you are sitting comfortably because I have quite a few things to tell you. Let me start again by telling you how happy I am to see you all wealthy and participating at this Congress. We are still living difficult times and health comes first. So our thoughts are obviously going to those who have been suffering from the pandemic, and also our prayers. And our thanks go to our modern angels, the medical and paramedical people who have done so much to help us. But let me also thank each and every one of you for your resilience, for your solidarity, for your work in this year. And let me as well thank and each and every member of the FIFA staff for what they are doing, for their contribution to keep the ball rolling. They've done an excellent job in the past year. Football stopped almost everywhere. It's now recovering slowly. But we can be a little bit optimistic for the future. We still have, though, to remain vigilant because the situation is not the same everywhere in the world. And football has proven resilient in this time. This requested compromise. It requested generosity of spirit. It requested teamwork. And you have all delivered on that because you rose, we rose, to this challenge. Because football is hope, football is joy, and a little bit of football brings also normality back. And I've been very happy that FIFA has been able to help you a little bit. For example, with the COVID relief plan. 1.5 
billion US dollars. This is unique in the world of sport. And this has been financed entirely from the reserves of FIFA with no external help because we have reserves. And why we have reserves? Well, because we have been running FIFA in the last few years in a professional and diligent way. Because money in FIFA does not evaporate anymore. And what we don't spend, we set it aside. Because actually, this money is not FIFA's money. This money is your money. And when you are in need, FIFA needs to be there to help. And that is exactly what we've tried to do with this COVID relief plan. It is, of course, my main responsibility to make sure that the resources we generate are invested in football with the highest standard of transparency, of compliance and of good governance. This is non-negotiable and this goes as well for the COVID relief plan. Equally important have been the return to football protocols. It was important to come back to play football. It was important to ensure safety. It was important to make sure that we can play again, even in empty stadiums. But it's a step in the right direction. And I would like to commend all of you for your efforts. I know it's not easy. Continue like that. And it's important to remember and to remind us as well of uh, the unity and the solidarity that we need. I would like to thank you for that. It's simple, but it's clear this has to be the pillar for our future. And by the way, we are on track to deliver on the 6.44 billion revenues for next year and will maybe even be a little bit better because we are working very hard for you and for football. What do we want to make in the year or in the years ahead? Well, we want to make football truly global. My responsibility as FIFA president is uh, to learn from the past, including from mistakes in the past, and to plan the future. That's what leadership is about. And that is what FIFA is about. Dear friends, Article 2 of our statutes, you should read it once, says that uh, it is our duty to improve the game of football and to promote it globally. And that is, it is also our duty to organize our own international competitions. Our competitions are your competitions because you are FIFA. And what, in whatever we do, we always have to think about the fans. We always have to think about the countries, all the countries in the world. And we always have to think about the players. We are at the service of football. We are not the protagonists of football. We have to set the scene for the players to shine and for the fans to enjoy, to live football with passion. We have to know what our job is. And ultimately, where do we want to go to? Well, we want to have uh, 50 top national teams and 50 top clubs worldwide. Women and men alike, by the way. Because we have to ask ourselves, dear friends, we are always saying football is the global sport, but is football really global? Well, the answer is no, it is not. Clubs, for example, there are fewer and fewer countries and even fewer clubs who have the highest resources. And this financial disparity 
which goes along with supporting this party, is growing. Out of the top 30 clubs in terms of revenues, there is not one single club from outside of Europe. And out of the top 20, they are all from only five European countries. And this trend is going into more imbalance and not into more balance. When it comes to national teams, the trend is also going into more imbalance. 100% of the semi-finalists in the last four World Cups came from only two confederations, Europe and South America. Seven out of eight of the last eight in the Women's World Cup came from Europe, and one from CONCACAF, United States, who then won the tournament. So, dear friends, we have to congratulate the European member associations. They are doing a fantastic job. And we want Europe to grow even more. But we want the rest of the world and the rest of Europe, who is not part of the elite, to grow as well and at a much higher pace than so far. Because we want to make football truly global. We are speaking a lot, and we are speaking a lot in the last few weeks about the football pyramid. The clubs, the leagues, the member associations, the confederations, and at the top of the pyramid, you have FIFA. And a lot has been talked as well in recent weeks about a Super League in Europe. Some kind of breakaway competition outside the football structures. I have said it before, and let me say it again clearly and unequivocally. FIFA is against any such project. We believe, I believe, that football does not and should not have to look outside of our institutional structures to address the challenges of our sport. Above all, we should not depart from or lose faith in the core principles of solidarity and equal opportunity. These are the pillars upon which our sport is built. At the same time, and I also want to be very clear about this. The existing model of football is not perfect either. As we have seen, we have a situation across the world where there is insufficient balance. We do not see equal opportunities throughout the world. We do not necessarily see too much solidarity either, to be honest. And there is, frankly speaking, a concentration of money and player talent which does not serve the global development interests of the game. And it is our responsibility as FIFA to address this imbalance. We cannot simply ignore it. And we will address it with everyone in a spirit of cooperation and dialogue. So how are we going to make football truly global. We want to focus on 11 areas. 11 areas for action, for a concrete action. The first one is, of course, the international match calendar. And we will face, I can tell you already now, challenges and questions. How many matches can a player play per year? How many competitions do we want or do we need? And what kind of competitions? Do we play too much? Or don't we play enough, maybe, in some parts of the world? Do we want more games? Or do we want less but more meaningful games? And what about these intercontinental travel of players when they have to play for their national teams? We have to realize that the international match calendar is global and has to take into account of the variety of situations, such as climate and geography, all over the world. 
And let me be very clear, the starting point is not the calendar is full and so nothing changes. The starting point is the exact opposite of that. We have a blank sheet of paper and we are open to take on board all views and opinions about how we can make the international match calendar better. Maybe we cannot, but we need to try. We need to be open. We need to be inclusive. We need to give the right to speak to everyone without any fear because we need to find the right balance, the right balance between club football and national team football, the right balance between top and grassroots, the right balance for what will be right for football. You know, in the past decades, FIFA was busy with other things, not with competitions, except for the World Cup. During these decades, many leagues, associations and confederations have developed and grown their competitions. And it's great because this is football. This is what football is about. Now we have even private organizations, private companies who organize international competitions. So where is FIFA in this? It is our statutory duty to do it. It is our task to do it with you and for you. Because we need the world to participate and not just a few. And also for solidarity. Let me explain you one thing. Today, a big league generates revenues, billions of revenues, from all over the world. And these revenues are distributed where? To the 20 clubs, or 18, or whatever it is, of that particular league with a small percentage going to solidarity in that particular country. A confederation organizes competition, generates its revenues from all over the world, and distributes its revenues to the participating clubs and a little bit on solidarity in the continent. And this is normal. It's their right to do so. They act in accordance with their statutes and regulations. But the only body in the world who is generating revenues from all over the world and reinvests and distributes its revenues all over the world in solidarity and football development is FIFA. And we need to take this element as well into account when we speak about, we, about uh, uh, the development of football. So the second area are the men's competitions. We have already decided, as you know, to increase the number of teams for the World Cup in 26 from 32 to 48. And we did so without increasing the number of games for the team that will be world champion. With 32 teams or 48 teams, you still have to play seven, seven games in 32 days if you want to become world champion. Exactly the same. But we give 16 countries in the world the, the, the dream and the possibility to play in a World Cup. And we know what this means to qualify for a World Cup, for a football movement, for a country, for the pride of everyone. The same for the Club World Cup. We have decided to create a new expanded Club World Cup, which should foster club football all over the world. Because we need to be inclusive. We need inclusivity. In a spirit of understanding and compromise, the first edition of this Club World Cup, which should have been taking place now, has been postponed. Of course, in the same spirit of understanding and compromise, we will fix a new date for this new Club World Cup, which will be an exciting tournament for the world. The third area is uh, women's competitions. And let me give you one figure at the outset. The increase in the number of teams, women's national team, who participated in the qualifiers of the World Cup, 2019, compared to 2023, is incredible. We move from 140 to over 180 participants. Very soon, all of our 211 member associations will have a women's national team because those who are not yet there, they are preparing 
to be there. A new era is starting for women's football, dear friends. A new era in which we have asked the Congress to agree that it should be up to the Congress to vote for the host of the next Women's World Cup. Like for the men, why there is a difference? Doesn't make sense. In a bidding process which has to be professional, transparent and ethical, as it was the case. We are investing one billion US dollars in four years to boost women's football. We will talk about the frequency of the Women's World Cup. Should it take place every two years or every four years as it is now? The first one launching this idea was the president of, of the French Football Federation, now joined by the president of the Saudi Football Federation. Let's see. Let's discuss. And we want to launch as well a new Women's Club World Cup because women's club football is equally important as men's club football. And we are working with our women's football department on the professionalization of women's football with modules tailor-made for all member associations, giving pathways to girls to be able to shine on the highest stage. And we will commercialize women's football also independently. We are not going anymore to our broadcasters and sponsors and tell them, you want to buy the men's World Cup? We give you in addition the women's as well. These times are over, gone. So make no mistake, dear friends, women's football is about to become one of the world's most popular sports. And this is not only a sporting achievement, also a social one. And we can all be proud. You can be proud of that. The next area are number four, the youth competitions. We've been talking for a couple of years now, what do we want to do with our youth competitions? We have under 17s, under 20s, boys and girls, every two years. We need commitment to make changes here. We know that if we keep the tournaments every two years, every second year, many talents are getting lost. A 17-year-old boy in a country has five times more chances to participate in a World Cup than a 16-year-old, just because the World Cup happens to be in that particular year. So we need to see if we want to play our youth competitions yearly or every two years. The next area, number five, is uh, linked with the financial regulation. It's also an important area. And uh, the pandemic has shown, I think, to all of us how fragile the football ecosystem is. We have uh, been taking, in the framework of the transfer system, some provisional measures to help. But we need to put in place, in the transfer reform, serious financial control mechanisms. We need them to protect clubs. We need them to protect players. We need them to protect the whole football ecosystem. And we need to have for the new transfer system the highest standards of transparency and accountability. We don't have to shy away from topics such as uh, tighter players' agents regulations, or salary caps, or transfer fee caps, or transparent calculation mechanisms to see what we are talking about. Because we need to bring a bit of light in the opacity of all these transfer transactions. Let me show you just one figure in this respect. The figure you can see here on the screen. In the last pre-COVID year, 2019, the global transfer spend for international transfers was around 7 billion US dollars, moving from one country to the other. The agent fees, players' agent fees, were around 700 million US dollars. And the money which went to training clubs 
was around 70 million US dollars. I think these figures are quite telling. And I think that we cannot be satisfied with them. And for this reason, we have put in place a clearinghouse. A clearinghouse which will work to make sure that those clubs investing in training and being entitled to a training compensation and a solidarity payment will receive the money. With this clearinghouse, everything will be automatic. And this means concretely that instead of 50 million or 60 or 70 million every year, the clubs will receive every year, the training clubs, up to 300 million, which is money which is due to them, but which is not paid today. 300 million a year for training clubs is a lot of money. Of course, it is our duty to make sure that this is going to happen. And similarly, and I would like to thank the stakeholders and the stakeholder committee, we are looking and we have established a fund for players. I was saying we have to think about fans, about players as well. Not only the top players, but all the players. And we have established a fund of 16 million US dollars, of which more than 1,000 players have already benefited. 1,000 players who lost their job. The lion's share of this money goes actually to players in Europe. Because we need to help those players who don't have the means. The next step, or the next area, is the laws of the game. This is an area for IFAB, but FIFA is obviously already, as well, part of that. We need always to foster attacking football. And the offside rule is definitely one of these rules that we need to look at. One week after I was elected FIFA president, there was my first IFA meeting, and we decided to scrap the double penalty or triple penalty rule, you remember, red card and penalty at the same time and suspension of the player. After 10 years of discussion, 10 years, in one week, we took it away, everyone was happy. Because this is what football wants. We have changed a few rules, a few laws, to make the game faster. And now we are looking and we are testing a possible new offside rule. Why? Because uh, if you look at the history of the offside rule, it has been developed in order to foster attacking football. So we need to see what we can do. In addition, VAR has created a situation which maybe was not expected. Before VAR, referees were told, in case of doubt, give the advantage to the attacker. With VAR, you don't have doubts anymore. And the term marginal offside has become suddenly an important term. And people are saying, well, it's marginal offside. How can it be? It's the famous nose, right, who is offside. We shouldn't cancel the goal just because the nose is offside. Well, it's the rule. It is the, it is the rule. So we have to see if we need to change this rule. So the current rule says that if any part of your body with which you can score a goal is over the line of the second last defender, then it's offside. We are testing the opposite rule, so to say, saying that if any part of your body with which you can score a goal is in line with the defender, then it's not offside. To give an advantage, of course, to the attacking player. One statistic here as well. In the Premier League last season, there were four offside situations per game. With this new rule, two out of these offside situations would be onside, and maybe a few more scores, a few more goals would have been scored. But of course, we need to see what kind of impact this has on the game, and that's why we are testing it currently in uh, America and in China. And Professor Arsene Wenger is supervising this work, so we are in safe hands there. Speaking about the laws of the game, let me also say a word about protecting players' health. We have introduced the five substitutions exactly for this reason. And we'll have to look into that. 
very soon. And we have introduced also a concussion substitution. We are studying this question. We need to be aware of the situation and we need to do whatever we can to protect the players. Lastly, on the laws of the game, let me just say a word about the VAR or VAR. We have more than 100 competitions worldwide who use VAR. And VAR is definitely bringing more justice and more transparency into the game. The margin of error of referees has moved from 95 to 99 percent. Yes, there is still 1 percent, but it's better 1 than 5. The big, big, big decisions or mistakes are corrected. And this is a help for the referee, and it is a help for the justice of the game. And we want to help all 211 associations by developing a VAR light, a lighter system of VAR that can still give the possibility with less cameras, with less infrastructure to help the referees. Let's move to the seventh area, which is football development and the forward program. And this is probably the greatest achievement since 2016, because we have multiplied by five the funds for you. Five times more. We did not increase our revenues by a factor of five. We did not even double our revenues. But we were able to increase uh, development monies by 500% in the forward program simply because we do our job seriously. Simply because money does not disappear. This is a sea change in the culture of FIFA. And you know, because you're in it, that this is also linked with tighter controls on your end, on what you are doing with this money. And uh, stay tuned because uh, Forward 3.0 is coming very, very soon. Speaking about football development, we need to go to the eighth um, area. And we go to technical development. The first action here, which has already been kicked off, is called Give Every Talent a Chance. Arsene Wenger and his team have gathered data from all member associations. More than 20,000 pages of data. And they are elaborating a tailor-made concept for each country on how best to operate to give every talent in the country a chance to play. We're looking very, for, very much forward to that. The second area of uh, technical development, so to say, is the professionalization of referees, something we never speak about. But we should, because there is no football without referees. The referees are our team, and we have to protect them always, even when they make mistakes. Now, if you are lucky, and you are born, say, in Italy, you can make a living of being referee. But if you are born in 90% of the countries in the world, this is not the case. And we cannot ask somebody who has to work part-time or full-time and in the evening jog and, and train a little bit to referee professional players. We need to establish a professionalization for referees. It's, it is crucial for their protection and for their independ independence because they come, of course, under heavy pressures everywhere in the world. So we need to work on that. We are and have established already some pilot projects and we work on that with some of you. The ninth area, very important area of course, is the social role of football. We need to be aware of our social role. 
And the first point I want to mention here is the zero tolerance on discrimination. This is another virus, racism. And football, sadly, is not immune of that. So let me be very clear. There is no place for any type of discrimination in football. No place. We are all equal. And if somebody thinks that he can come to football and discriminate others, then my message is clear as well. You go out. We will continue to educate, but we will also sanction very harshly because it is intolerable. We can also, though, use football to improve society and to cast positive examples. I've been meeting in the last years some senior political figures. And we have achieved some results by pushing boundaries, for example, on human rights, on, on, on women rights, sorry, in some countries, or on labor law reforms in other countries. And this brings me to the human rights situation. And in the recent um, World Cup qualifiers, some footballers have been taking the field to raise human rights concerns and workers' rights. Now, I can tell you that since 2016, this is a top priority for us. And we have achieved some progress. We know that there are challenges, and we know that more can be done. But any discussion on this matter should be based on verified facts. As is confirmed by Transparency International, not by FIFA, by the ILO, International Labour Organization, not by FIFA, by the BWI, Building and Woodworkers International, labor unions, not by FIFA, significant, significant progress has been made. But it's clear as well that FIFA's doors are always open, always open to discuss and to debate. And I can tell you that the FIFA World Cup in Qatar next year will not only be the greatest tournament ever, but will also leave a lasting and positive social legacy in the country and also in the entire region. Of course, some criticize what we do, and I'm sure that their concerns are genuine and also legitimate. But again, I invite you all to consider the facts first. And then form your own opinion on whether football has made or has not made a positive difference because I believe it has. Let's speak as well about child protection when we speak about the social role of football. It is important that our children can play football in a safe and secure environment. What worse crime can we think about than abusing a child? Difficult to think about something worse. Yet, this happens in society, and this happens as well in football, and we cannot hide it, and we don't have to hide it. We have to fight it. And for this, we need an international structure who can help us fighting it. We are ready to engage in that with governments, with sports institutions, because it's not just about football, it's about children, boys and girls alike. The next area, still on the social role of football, is climate. Climate is also, of course, a priority for FIFA. In 2016, FIFA has become the first sports organization to join the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Climate Neutral Now campaign. In 2018, at the COP24 in Poland, 
we committed to reduce carbon emission by 45 percent until 2030 and be carbon neutral by 2050. These are just steps, but everything that goes in between these steps, such as the fact that we put elements on climate protection as well in our bidding documents, like for human rights, are important to show that football is much more than just a sport. Coming back to the sport, though, we need to look at integrity. If uh, before players enter the pitch, they have the feeling that the match is rigged, or the fans have that feeling, then the soul of football is dead. We know that around 50% of the world's sports betting is invested or played in football. At FIFA, we are monitoring 36,000 games a year. 0.4% of these games, around 150, show some suspicious pattern. But once we have that, what do we do? How can we act? So we have established with the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes a FIFA Global Integrity Programs, which involves all of you, all the 211 member associations, because we need to work together, and we need to work together with law enforcement agencies to tackle match fixing. Next item is education, very important, and the Football for Schools project, which is very close to my heart and I know to the hearts of many of you. We want to bring football to the schools, but not just playing football, educating through football. Because football is teaching us so many things. It's teaching us respect. It's teaching us team spirit. And with the excuse of football, you can speak about anything, about discrimination, about gender equality, about empowerment. And we have elaborated a program, again, together with UNESCO and the World Food Program, to go to 700 million kids all over the world. And we are looking for partners as well to help us in uh, this area. And a Pan-African football, schools football tournament, which has just been launched, is going as well exactly in that direction. Education and football together. Let me say, to conclude this part, that FIFA has become, in the last few years, a trustworthy partner. I was telling you some years ago that FIFA was uh, toxic, that nobody wanted to come anywhere close to FIFA, and it was true. Today, we have uh, agreements, working structured agreements with the World Health Organization, with UN Women, with the UN ODC, with uh, UNESCO, with the World Food Programme, with the African Union, with the Council of Europe, with ASEAN, with the G20, very soon with uh, CARICOM as well, and many others. And I would like at this stage, on behalf of all of you, to thank all these international organizations to play together with us in the same team for our children, for our society. Let's go to the tenth area. And that is, of course, the fans. Football is the people's game. We need to remember that. I am a fan as well. Would have preferred to be a player, but when you have two left feet and are right footed, it's a bit complicated. So I'm a fan, like many, many, many of you, I know that. And football is the people's game. We had, uh, just to cite again a few figures, 1.2 billion viewers at the last Women's World Cup. We had 4 billion viewers at the last Men's World Cup. So we have over 5 billion football fans worldwide. And each one of these football fans is fan of what? He's fan first of his country, of his national team or her national team. Then he's fan of a local club, the club of his city, the club where he's grown. And then he's as well a fan of one of these big global clubs, and sometimes in recent days as well of some individual players. 
Now, I firmly believe that it is our task and our job to work in order to give each of these five billion fans something with which he can live his passion. We don't have to look only at one or two or three. We have to look at everything, at making football truly global. And the last area, number 11, is uh, digital. Why digital? Well, we have seen, we have just seen with the figures that football has uniquely the ability to connect the entire world. Recently, technology is also enhanced and has the possibility to connect the world as well, in another way, but still to connect. So if we can somehow join the global appeal of football and the new opportunities that digital technology offers, we can achieve great things. We can make our sport more popular. We can democratize it more. And we will involve you all, all 211 member associations who will be part of a new digital FIFA venture. Stay tuned and you will hear from us very soon. So these are the 11 areas for action. There is a lot on the plate, but there is also a lot of energy and motivation and enthusiasm to tackle each and every one of these areas from top to bottom. So let me conclude by uh, saying, as you have seen, that we have very clear objectives for the year ahead. We want to make football truly global. And we want to do that together. Because we need you, the 211 FIFA member associations. We need you all to speak up. We need you all to tell us what you think, to tell us what you want, to tell us how we can make football globally better. And together, dear friends, together we will shape the future of football. This is the time. Thank you very much. I wish you a great continuation of the Congress. And we move to agenda item eight. I finished my speech, by the way, so you can go now and have a coffee if you want but don't stay away too long. Uh, agenda item 8.1, the annual report. Uh, we will have a look at the quick video with the activities of 2020. Thank you very much. my vision 2020 to 2023. And to protect the integrity of the game. Instead, they corrupted the business of worldwide soccer. FIFA as an organization has made great efforts to educate, to train, and to promote within a culture of compliance. We have to do our part of uh, the job. We have to implement 
good governance, ethics and compliance at the highest standards. Thank you very much. So we are back and you've seen uh, our activities or a snapshot of our activities in the last year in 2020. You received, of course, as well, the corresponding report about that. Let's move now to agenda item 8.2, 8.3 and 8.4 together. Uh, 8.2 is the consolidated financial statements for 2020. 8.3, the FIFA statutory financial statements for 2020 and 8.4, the auditor's report to the Congress. Uh, can I ask uh, to play a video by the chairman of the Finance Committee, Don Alejandro Dominguez, please. Dear members of the football community, at first, on behalf of the Finance Committee, I wish you and your family are all well and in fine spirit. COVID-19 devastated lives and livelihood everywhere, and our sport was not immune. At the peak of the pandemic, football had stopped in 207 of FIFA's 211 member associations to help members of the football community conquer the crisis. We launched the FIFA COVID-19 relief plan with a budget of $1.5 billion. By the end of the 2020, FIFA has released the COVID-19 relief plan funds in the amount of $340 million. With so many ongoing investments under the FIFA Forward Program 2.0, and confirmed investment in women's football, I am pleased to report that in 2020, FIFA's investment in football reached new heights. We also anticipated that 87% of the net revenue after sale cost would be reinvested in football by end of the 2019-2022 cycle. FIFA's revenue in 2020 was in line with its revised budget. At the end of the year, contracted revenue amounted to $5.125 billion, representing 80% of the total budget revenue for the 2019-2022 cycle. It gives me great pleasure and confidence to conclude that FIFA is well on track to achieve its revenue target and FIFA's financial position is healthy and robust with sufficient reserves. At the end of my speech, I would like to thank you most sincerely for the trust you have placed in us, as well as the support you have given to us in this challenging 2020 year. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Many thanks to the chairman of the Finance Committee, Alejandro Dominguez. And I would like to ask to play now the video uh, with the financial statements 2020 and the auditor's report to the Congress. Dear President, Dear members of the FIFA Council, dear members of the FIFA football family, it gives me great pleasure to present you FIFA's financial results for 2020. Obviously, it was a very challenging year and a particular demanding one for football. Before we go into the details, I would like to highlight the most important topics. First of all, despite the impact of the global pandemic on the international match calendar, 
and the global economy, FIFA's revenue in 2020 exceeded its revised budget. Even more important, by the end of the year, FIFA had contracted already 80% of the full cycle revenue budget. In other words, we are well on track to achieve the target of 6.44 billion US dollars for the 2019 to 22 cycle. Second, FIFA's financial position is very healthy. Thanks to this and the cost savings achieved in 2020, FIFA not only confirmed its investments under the forward program, it also launched a COVID-19 relief plan to support the members of the football community with a budget of 1.5 billion US dollars. Thirdly, FIFA will have invested over 3.2 billion US dollars into football by the end of this cycle. This means that we should easily surpass the pledge made by the FIFA president in 2016 to invest 4 billion US dollars by the end of 26. Let us move to the 2020 income statement in more detail. Revenue for the year amounted to 267 million US dollars, 7% above the revised budget. The majority of revenue came from licensing rights, followed by marketing rights. TV broadcasting rights remained low as a result of the postponement of the tournaments in 2020. FIFA's total investment was just above 1 billion US dollars. This figure comprises the budgeted investments for its regular operations of 774 million and 271 million US dollars, which reflects the part of the COVID relief plan taken from FIFA's reserves. I would like to highlight that FIFA saved a considerable amount across the board, most important in administrative costs, which were 20% below the revised budget. The net financial income was also very positive in 2020, despite lower interest rates due to COVID-19. In total, the net financial results amounted to 95 million US dollars. Overall, FIFA closed the year with a net result of minus 683 million US dollars, which we will take from FIFA's reserves. This figure is well above the budget. The balance sheet at the end of the year reflects FIFA's solid financial position. The total assets amounted to 4.5 billion US dollars, of which a strong 77% was in the form of cash, as well as short and long-term financial assets. Total reserves stood at 1.9 billion US dollars, 89 million US dollars above the budgeted amount. An important health indicator for an organization is its access to and availability of cash. At the end of 2020, cash and cash equivalents stood at 1.155 billion US dollars, 48% up from the previous year. This high level of liquidity is the result of an active shift into shorter duration investments, which enabled FIFA to respond with speed and flexibility to the impact which COVID-19 had on the global football community. Besides the consolidated financial statements, the FIFA administration is also responsible for preparing FIFA's standalone financial statement in accordance with Swiss law and the FIFA statutes. The income statement for 2020 shows a net profit of 13 million Swiss francs. The association capital and reserves amounts to 128 million Swiss francs, and the reserves for statutory obligations to 1.6 billion Swiss francs. The FIFA financial statements for 2020 have been audited by FIFA's auditor. It's my pleasure now to hand over to Mr. Balkani from PwC. Dear President, the member of the Council, dear representatives of the membership associations. As a representative of PricewaterhouseCoopers, it is my honor to present today our audit results. First of all, I would like to say thank you for your attention and also your trust in PwC. As Thomas Payer pointed out before, we audited two different sets of financial statements. On the one hand, the consolidated financial statements, and on the other hand, the statutory financial statements of FIFA. I would like to start with the results of the audit of the FIFA's consolidated financial 
statements. You will find our audit opinion on pages 166 to 172 in the FIFA's annual report. On page 166, the following is explained. The overall maturity was 10.45 million US dollar. The audit scope, which confirms that we covered 97.7% of the consolidated revenue and 96.2% of the consolidated expenses. And finally, the key audit matters. On the one hand, the appropriateness and application of the revenue recognition policy. And on the other hand, the financial implication of legal cases and or potential claims. The results of the audit have been disclosed on page 166. As a result of our audit, we confirm that the consolidated financial statements of FIFA give a true and fair view with respect to the consolidated financial position of the group as at 31st December 2020, the consolidated financial performance and the consolidated cash flows for the year ended 31st December 2020 and complies with the Swiss law. I have nothing to add to our conclusion. Furthermore, I shortly present the results of the audit of the FIFA statutory financial statements. This audit has been performed in line with the Swiss auditing standards and the financial statements have been prepared in line with the Swiss Code of Obligation. I confirm that the FIFA statutory financial statements are prepared in line with the Swiss law and the articles of incorporation. Furthermore, we confirm that the internal control system exists. Therefore, we recommend that the consolidated financial statements and the statutory financial statements of FIFA be approved by the Congress. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much uh, to um, Mr. Balkani, our auditor, who is also present physically with us here today. And thanks to Thomas Payer, our CFO. We can then move to agenda item 8.5, the report by the chairman of the FIFA Audit and um, Compliance Committee. We have a video there as well. Dear President, dear members of the FIFA Council, dear delegates, it has been four years since the Congress selected this Audit and Compliance Committee, four years that started in turmoil, brought about a lot of change and progress, and then climaxed in an unexpected global pandemic. This shows us that much like football, life is unpredictable and a proper immune system needs to be in place to tackle any challenge. Luckily, FIFA is now fully equipped to meet these challenges head on. Allow me to review some of the achievements of the Audit and Compliance Committee has tried for over these past years. One of the biggest challenges at the beginning was certainly to establish a culture of acceptance for the control mechanisms that were much needed. For the first time in FIFA history, a fully developed compliance program was implemented. At the same time, a proper risk management system was introduced, and we now have a well-embedded internal audit function in place the results of which I'm pleased to say we're starting to see. In addition, for the first time in football history, FIFA implemented the proper bit evaluation process for the selection of the FIFA World Cup 2026. It was the most transparent and comprehensive bidding process FIFA has ever conducted, and it has proven successful, but this does not end here. Maintaining this culture of acceptance and ensuring long-term success for the control mechanisms are the responsibility of management and require consistent work by the Audit and Compliance Committee. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members of the Audit and Compliance Committee for their dedication and commitment over the past four years. 
We tackled all the important financial questions within FIFA and worked together as a team. Of course, there is still room for improvement. But with our joint efforts, together within the FIFA administration, we have managed to bring things under control and we continue to strive to do so. I think it's important to point out that these efforts of the FIFA administration and the Audit and Compliance Committee do not only contribute to FIFA as an organization, but also to you, the member associations. Last year, the Audit and Compliance Committee tried a different approach and sought di direct communication with the member associations to establish a better mutual understanding of the committee's mandate and expectation on both sides. Unfortunately, this was put on hold because of the pandemic. However, over the last years, the system of the annual central review has been fully implemented and a year by year, we found the discipline among the member associations to be continually increasing. As a result, we entrusted you with a huge responsibility by providing you with the additional funds under the COVID-19 relief plan. Together, we have to ensure that those funds are spent wisely and properly. I cannot stress enough that the risks have not decreased and the importance of there being a culture of acceptance for the control mechanism on all levels. The funds with which FIFA has entrusted you will always belong to football and we do not want to see any misuse, not now and not in the future, as this would be an own goal for the game, which we are all hope will soon be back to full strength worldwide. With regard to the financial report, the Audit and Compliance Committee carefully reviewed the FIFA Annual Report 2020 and noted the report's quality and completeness. Furthermore, the committee found that the statutory audits report satisfied the independence criteria required under the FIFA statute. On behalf of the committee, I recommend that the Congress approve these reports. In closing, the Audit and Compliance Committee is aware that 2020 has been a whole different ball game for everyone. But we all need to remind ourselves of our respective responsibilities and join forces to ensure that football bounces back stronger than ever. Thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks. Many thanks to Thomas Wessel, the chairman of our Audit and Compliance Committee, for his report. And many thanks as well to all the members for their excellent work. We can move now to agenda item 8.6, which is uh, the vote on the approval of the consolidated financial statements for 2020 and the FIFA statutory financial statements for 2020. Uh, so we have asked the Congress to approve the consolidated financial statements, uh, as I said, and I'm asking the Secretary General to give us the results. just announce that uh, all 211 member association of uh, FIFA joined the Congress online already a while ago. So everybody's here. Excellent. <laughs> we managed to get them all on board. Thanks for With being With regard here. to uh, agenda item 8.6, the Congress decided to approve the Consolidated Financial Statement for 2020 and the FIFA Statutory Financial Statement for 2020 with the following result. 208 yes, no abstention, and no rejection. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Important uh, results. Um, let's go to agenda item. 8.7, the detailed budget for 2022. Video, please. The FIFA administration prepared the detailed budget for 22 based on the revised 2019 to 22 four year budget. The 22 budget takes into account the economic impact 
of COVID-19 and its effect on the international match calendar, whereby it is assumed that the global vaccination programs will start to have an impact by around mid-year and the effects of the pandemic will start to soften thereafter. The total revenue budget for 2022 amounts to 4,666 million US dollars. Of the five revenue categories, television broadcasting rights remains the largest contributor at 2,640 million US dollars, followed by marketing rights, hospitality rights, and ticket sales, licensing rights, and other revenue. As mentioned earlier, 80% of the full cycle budget had already been contracted by the end of 2020, and I am confident that the revenue budget for the 2019 to 22 cycle will be achieved in full. The total investment budget for 22 amounts to 3,138 million US dollars, including 2,696 million US dollars for football and 442 million for administrative and commercial expenses. The 22 result before taxes and financial result is budgeted at 1.5 billion US dollars. All details of the 22 annual budget can be found in the FIFA Annual Report 2020. The FIFA Council and the Finance Committee reviewed the budget for 22 and recommend that the FIFA Congress approve it. Thank you. Thank you very much to our uh, CFO. Um, so we can go to the vote on the approval of the detailed budget. We asked you if you were ready to approve the budget. Secretary General, what was the result? Uh, Congress has decided here again to approve the detailed budget for 2022 with the following result. 208 yes, zero rejection. Motion passed, Mr. President. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Again, a very important result also because it is the last year of the cycle, as we know, and uh, maybe by next year we'll have even some better news in this respect. I would just like to remind everyone who is following this Congress, not only uh, the member associations, but also everyone else, that detailed financial reports, activity reports are published on our website and much, much more than that. And you can find all the details uh, in these documents. There are not any more strange payments made in any way whatsoever. And that's why we can present such outstanding figures. Let's move to agenda item number nine, the vote on proposals for amending the statutes, regulations governing the application of the statutes and the standing orders of the Congress. Also here, we have a video. Dear President, members of the FIFA Council and representatives of the member associations, on 19 March 2021, the FIFA Council approved a set of amendments to the FIFA statutes and the regulations governing the application of the statutes, which are presented to you for voting today. Basically, these amendments can be grouped into the following four main categories. Selection by the FIFA Congress of the host country or countries of the FIFA Women's World Cup final competition, merging of the Governance Committee and the Audit and Compliance Committee, setting up of the Football Tribunal, and finally, the so-called miscellaneous amendments. Here, we present a brief summary of these proposed amendments and the reasons behind their suggested implementation. According to Article 34, Paragraph 10, and Article 69 of the FIFA Statutes, the competent bodies deciding on the hosting of the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup are not the same. While the FIFA Congress votes on the designation of the host country of the FIFA World Cup final competition, the FIFA Council remains competent to decide the venue 
of the FIFA Women's World Cup final competition. In recent years, FIFA has been working hard to develop women's football across the world. Among other initiatives, FIFA established a dedicated women's football division, published its first comprehensive women's football strategy, bolstered the participation of women in decision-making positions, set a key objective of increasing the number of registered female players to 60 million by 2026, and double investment in women's game to 1 billion US dollar over the current four-year cycle. Therefore, in order to enhance the unique and elite international status of both competitions, a set of amendments to the FIFA statutes have been proposed to make the FIFA Congress competent to vote on the designation of the host country or countries of the FIFA Women's World Cup final competition. This proposal will affect Articles 28, 34, 68 of the FIFA statutes. The responsibilities of the Governance Committee and the Audit and Compliance Committee are established by Articles 40 and 51 of the FIFA statutes, respectively, as well as the relevant provisions of the FIFA governance regulations. Many duties and functions assigned to both the Governance Committee and the Audit and Compliance Committee are closely connected and frequently overlap. For the sake of efficiency and efficacy, it appears logical to combine the two committees to form a single independent committee to be called Governance, Audit and Compliance Committee and undertaking all of the functions, duties and responsibilities currently assigned separately to the two committees. Therefore, a set of amendments to the FIFA statutes have been proposed to merge the Governance Committee with the Audit and Compliance Committee to form the new Governance, Audit and Compliance Committee. This proposal will affect Articles 27, 28, 30, 34, 39, 40, 49 and 50 of the FIFA statutes. Article 5, paragraph 2 of the FIFA statutes states that FIFA shall provide the necessary institutional means to resolve any dispute that may arise between or among member associations, confederations, clubs, officials and players. The necessary institutional means currently in place to resolve disputes are the Player Status Committee and the Dispute Resolution Chamber. The Player Status Committee currently has two separately functions, legislative and policy making, as well as regulatory decision making functions. However, the Football Stakeholders Committee introduced in 2017 has, in practice, adopted the legislative and policy making functions of the Player Status Committee. In this context, a set of amendments to the FIFA statutes have been proposed as follows. The legislative function of the Player Status Committee will be taken over exclusively by the Football Stakeholders Committee, and therefore, the Player Status Committee will be abolished as a standing committee and a new football tribunal will be created as the institutional umbrella to be responsible for the regulatory decision-making powers. It is proposed that the football tribunal have the following three chambers. The dispute resolution chamber, the player station chamber, and the new agent chamber. This proposal will affect articles 24, 34, 39, 46. 49, 54, and 74 of the FIFA statutes, and Articles 5, 7, 8, and 9 of the proposed regulations governing the application of the statutes. Finally, a set of miscellaneous amendments to the FIFA statutes have been proposed 
that aim at including further disciplinary measures, amendments as per the upcoming football agent regulations, and amendments with regard to match agents. If you approve these amendments to the FIFA statutes and the regulations governing the application of the statutes, they will come into effect immediately. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias and thank you very much uh, to uh, Don Emilio Garcia, our chief legal officer, for this brilliant uh, uh, presentation. So we have, I'm just looking here, uh, um, we have, of course, asked the Congress to approve or not to approve the amendments to the statutes, uh, the regulations governing the application of the statutes and the standing orders. And I will hand over to the Secretary General for the results. Thank you, President. As displayed on your screen, the Congress has decided to approve the amendment of the statutes and the regulation governing the application of the status with the following result. 207 yes. No MA rejected the motion, so the motion is passed, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Unanimous decision there as well in this case. This means we can move uh, then to agenda item number 10, and it's about the discussion of proposals duly submitted by member associations and the Council within the period stipulated in Article 28, Paragraph 1 of the FIFA Statutes. 10.1 is a proposal by the Jamaica Football Federation requesting a global women's football competition concept to be prepared, and uh, um, I would like to uh, launch a video which explains this proposal presented by Mr. Dalton Wind, the General Secretary of the Jamaica Football Federation. Please. Dear President Infantino, esteemed fellow member association, council members, ladies and gentlemen, First, please allow me to thank the FIFA Congress on behalf of the Jamaica Football Federation here in Kingston for the opportunity to present our proposal to you. Of course, we wish we could do so in person, but we understand that the situation around the world remains a challenge. We hope to see you all soon again. As we are aware, FIFA Women's Football Strategy has proved to be a valuable framework for ensuring long-term, sustainable, and measurable growth in the sport and helping to unlock its power throughout the world. The considerable investment which FIFA has made in women's football during the last five years in particular has yielded significant results in growing the sport exponentially. The 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup in France has rightfully been lauded as a watershed moment for the women's game and highlighted the importance of elite competition for the continued growth of women's football. We have seen this through our own experiences at the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup and CONCACAF's recent groundbreaking announcement relating to the new ecosystem of women's football competitions in our region through an emphasis upon growing, growing participation, enhancing the game's commercial value and encouraging leadership. FIFA Women's Football Strategy is also helping the Jamaica Football Federation to achieve its objectives. We strongly believe, however, that there remains an untapped potential to further showcase and improve women's football through global competitions. It is therefore proposed that the FIFA administration puts in place a comprehensive consultation process in order, in due course, and in advance of the next FIFA Congress, presents a global women's football competition concept. This would review current competition, both at the national team 
and club level and explore the possibility for new global competitions, such as a potential Women's World League. Already previously being discussed and supported by member associations in the Executive Football Summit in recent years. The Jamaica Football Federation hope that you share our passion and support for this initiative. We wish you an enjoyable remainder of the Congress and all the best of health for the weeks, months ahead until we meet again. One love, one heart, one destiny. Women's football for life. Thank you very much, uh, dear Dalton. Women football for life, definitely. Uh, and thanks for your explanation on the proposal that you have made, a proposal, as you said, that was also discussed in a summit in Jamaica a couple of years ago. I remember that as well. Very well. So we have been asking the associations uh, to approve uh, uh, this proposal as presented and I'm um, asking the Secretary General to give us the results. Thank you, Mr. President, and the Congress largely approved the proposal submitted by the Jamaican Football Federation requesting a global women's football competition concept to be prepared with the following result. 191 yes, and only three member associations rejected the motion. So the motion passed, Mr. President. Excellent. Thank you very much. So the administration will have to prepare, of course, in consultation with all the stakeholders, a comprehensive women's football competition concept, whether it's a league, whether it's a club World Cup, whether it's a World Cup every two years, use competitions every year instead of, instead of every two years. I think there is a lot to do there. Before going to the next agenda item, uh, I'm just looking into the room if there is anyone else who would like to talk about this topic of women's football. This is not the case. So we go to agenda item 10.2 uh, and the proposal by the Saudi Arabian Football Federation requesting a feasibility study to be carried out on the impact of playing the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup every two years. Also for this, uh, I would uh, kindly ask to play a video uh, where the president uh, of the Saudi Arabian Football Federation, Mr. Uh, Yasser al Misael, will present his proposal. Please. Dear FIFA President, dear Gianni, dear fellow member associations from across the world, dear council members, dear friends, it is my great pleasure to be able to address you today on the occasion of the 71st FIFA Congress. While it is, of course, unfortunate that we cannot gather together physically as during normal times, that we can do so virtually for the second time in less than a year using the power of a new technology is indeed a remarkable achievement. The value of remaining in contact despite our physical distance and continuing to exchange and discuss how we can improve football for everyone into the future is more important now than ever. We've seen throughout the past year that the importance of national team football to the entire football ecosystem cannot be underestimated. Much of what we do as member associations, not only in terms of national team football, but also with regard to domestic club competitions, is driven by and centered around the current four year cycles of both the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup. We believe the future of football is at a critical juncture. The many issues football has faced for numerous years have now been further exacerbated 
by the ongoing pandemic and global crisis. It is time to review how the global game is structured and to consider what is best for the future of our sport. This should include whether the current four-year cycle remains the optimum basis for how football is managed, both from a competition and commercial perspective, as well as in terms of overall football development. We must take into consideration the discussion required regarding the future of the men's and women's international match calendars and how any changes facilitated through these discussions will impact all of the FIFA's 211 member associations. It is therefore proposed that a decision is taken by the FIFA Congress to mandate the FIFA administration to perform a feasibility study on what impact of playing FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup every two years could be, and how this could feature within revised international match calendars. A wide-reaching analysis is suggested, looking not only at the direct impact of both the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup taking place every two years, but also considering the qualifying competitions for these tournaments. Having fewer, yet more meaningful, competitive national team matches could potentially address concerns regarding player welfare, whilst it, at the same time enhancing the value and merit of such competitions. On behalf of the Saudi Arabian Football Federation, I thank you for your consideration of this proposal. I wish you an enjoyable remainder of this FIFA Congress, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you um, very much to Yasser for his uh, very eloquent and uh, detailed uh, proposal. And as he rightly said, it's probably wider than that. You cannot just look at final tournaments in isolation. You need to consider, of course, in such a study, the whole qualifying competitions um, as well. Also, on this request, as we have to, we ask our member associations to let us know if they agree or not with the proposal. And indeed, Mr. President, <clears throat> the Congress has decided to approve the proposal submitted by the Saudi Arabia Football Federation requesting a feasibility study to be carried out on the impact of playing the FIFA World Cup and the FIFA Women's World Cup every two years with the following result. Of the total number of valid broadcasts of 188, 166 member associations voted in favor of the motion, while 22 rejected the motion. For that motion, a simple majority was required, so the motion is passed, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Well, that's a pretty eloquent majority there as well. And uh, uh, I'm told on this agenda item, I have a request to take the floor by uh, Mr. Fauzi Legja, the president of the Royal Moroccan Football Federation. Monsieur le Président, Fauzi. President Fauzi. Thank you, President. Well, thank you for giving me the floor and uh, a very good morning, good afternoon to all of my fellow presidents. President, just one moment. Could you please just raise your camera so that we can see uh, your face properly? Thank you. Perfect. So you can see my glasses very well now. Perfect. Well, I was congratulating you on... Uh, the smooth organization of this Congress, addressing these very complex issues. I'm taking the floor as president of the Royal Moroccan Football Association. 
but uh, to speak on behalf of CAF. We have discussed this uh, proposal from our dear colleague, uh, the President of the Saudi Arabian Football Association, and I'd like to congratulate him and the um, presidents of uh, Jamaica and Liberia as well for their proposals, because this uh, is, uh, has, has allowed us to discuss an issue that uh, seemed to be taboo in the past, and that is the reorganization of our competitions. In CAF, we completely support the review of the competition formats. And as you said, uh, President, this will help us to carry out our mission more successfully in accordance with the statutes to promote football development. The competition formats need to evolve so that we can allow football development to the full. And in CAF, we welcome the proposals and we wish to ask the administration to carry out this uh, review as quickly as possible so that we can have a platform for discussion and negotiation in place so that we can establish a new competition format going forward to allow the development of football. Having discussed this uh, in uh, considerable detail in CAF, we think that this will bring further growth to football and allow us to emerge from this challenging situation today and allow regions which are lagging behind to develop. And hopefully, this will allow us to reach uh, our target of uh, truly global football and a prosperous football um, with uh, a swifter and more significant development. So, President, on behalf of CAF, we fully support uh, these reviews and the thought process to have a look at the men's uh, and women's uh, competition formats and uh, youth competition formats too. And as my colleague, the President of uh, Saudi Arabia, has said, this will require a review of all competitions uh, which are already, which are also taking part, place in confederations. And once we've taken all of this into account, we'll be able to think carefully about all of these issues for the good of football, uh, uh, ensuring that uh, football is truly global. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed to the President uh, of the Moroccan uh, Association. Thank you for your support for this initiative. Um, yes, this will be uh, looked at by the FIFA administration and indeed uh, by all of the stakeholders of the football community. I don't see anyone else who would like to speak on this particular item. So we can move to agenda item 10.3, the proposal by the Liberia Football Association requesting a proposal for the future of youth competitions to be made. And uh, I would launch the video in which the president, Mr. Mustafa Raj, president of the Liberia Football Association, is presenting his proposal. Dear FIFA President, President Gianni Infantino, dear fellow delegates from member associations around the world, dear Secretary General, Madam Fatma Samora Diop, dear Vice Presidents and members of the FIFA Council, greetings from the headquarters of the Liberia Football Association here in Monrovia, the capital city of Liberia. We believe that the future of football lies in the sustainable youth development, through prioritizing equal access to participation, 
safeguarding our young players and giving them access to meaningful competition. Football brings to joy millions of young people worldwide and all member associations ensuring that the next generation of players are getting the best opportunities is a key objective. Increasing the future frequency of FIFA youth competitions for both boys and girls and reviewing the current age categories of these competitions was discussed around the world from during the recent FIFA football summits. The Liberia Football Association proposes the consultation process on this topic to continue in order to conclude with a proposal on the future of FIFA youth competitions. Being made by FIFA administration to members association ahead of subsequent FIFA Congress. We propose that the blending factors are taken into consideration as part of this process, including the appropriate age categories for future FIFA youth competitions, how frequently such competitions would take place and with how many participating members associate, the appropriate qualification pathways for these competitions, the cost structure for operations involved in organizing these competitions, and the potential commercial value. Fellow delegates and members of Congress, we'd like to extend our thanks and appreciation on behalf of the Liberia Football Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear uh, Mustafa, President of the Liberia Football Association. And by the way, let's not forget that the president of the country in Liberia is the great George Wea, somebody that has played a major, major role in North African, but world football. So, uh, we have asked as well the Congress to approve uh, uh, the proposal, um, Fatma. Yes, Mr. President, of the total 193 valid vote cast, a very comfortable majority of 189 voted in favor of the proposal submitted by the Liberia Football Association requesting a proposal for the future of FIFA's youth competition to be made, and four member associations voted against the motion. So motion passed, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Uh, so the motion is passed, and we will make proposals for the future youth competitions at FIFA. I'm just again looking into the room if anyone wants to intervene on the youth competitions. Uh, on this agenda item. This does not seem to be the case. So we can move uh, to agenda item 11, the election or dismissal of the chairpersons, deputy chairpersons, and members of the disciplinary committee, ethics committee, appeal committee, audit and compliance committee, and the governance committee. Uh, so, firstly, uh, the president, uh, well, uh, we have to uh, the Congress, sorry, was uh, asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names uh, are presented on the screen as members of the disciplinary committee for a term of office of four years. And I will ask the Secretary General to present the results. The present of the total number of uh, valid votes estimated at 202, a very large majority, if not all, Congresses voted in favor by 200 yes, and two member associations voted against the motion. So motion passed, Mr. President. Good. <clears throat> then the Congress was also asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names will be presented on the screen as a chairperson and a deputy chairperson of the disciplinary committee for a term of office of four years. Please, can we have the results? The result as shown on your screen shows that Mr. Don Jorge Palacio from Colombia was elected as a chairperson of the disciplinary committee with the majority of vote of 138. For the position of the deputy chairman of the disciplinary committee, 
Justice Anim Yeboa from Ghana was elected with also a very comfortable majority of 154 yes. Motion passed for Thank both you. candidates, Mr. President. Thank you. Then the Congress was asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons uh, whose names are presented on the screen as members of the investigatory chamber of the Ethics Committee for a term of office of four years. Please, Secretary General. Present for the agenda item number 11, a total number of 204 vote was considered as valid, out of which 199 voted in favor of the motion, while five member associations rejected the motion. The motion is passed with a very comfortable majority, Mr. President. <clears throat> Thank you very much. The Congress then was asked also to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose name will be presented on the screen as a chairperson and deputy chairpersons of the investigatory chamber of the Ethics Committee for a term of office of four years. Please, Secretary General. Mr. President, Mr. Martin Ngonga from Rwanda has been appointed or elected by the Congress with 130 three positive vote, while the deputy chairpersons voted are respectively Mr. Bruno De Vita from Canada with 164 vote in favor of his election, and Mr. Parasu Naram Subramanian from Malaysia with 139 positive vote. So motion passed for both the chairperson and the two deputy chairperson of the Ethics Committee Investigatory Chamber. <clears throat> then uh, the Congress was asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons who na whose names are presented on the screen as members of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the Ethics Committee for a term of office of four years. Secretary General, the uh, results? The total number of valid vote cast for this motion was 203, of which 199 voted in favor of the motion, while four member associations rejected the motion. For that motion, we needed a simple majority of valid vote of 102, so this is a very comfortable yes for the election of the members in block of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the FIFA Ethic Committee. Thank you. The Congress was then also asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names will be presented on the screen as a chairperson and deputy chairpersons of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the Ethics Committee for a term of office of four years. Please, Secretary General. The result show that uh, uh, for the Adjudicatory Chamber of the Ethics Committee, the person elected as a chair is Mr. Vasilos Kouris, from Greece with 137 positive votes. And the two deputy chairperson are respectively Mr. Ma Mrs. Maria Claudia Rojas from Colombia with 151 yes, and Mr. Fiti Sunia from American Samoa with 146 votes in favor. So Mr. President, the motion for the election of the chairperson and the two deputy chairperson of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the <coughs> FIFA IT Committee has been passed. Thank you very much. The Congress was then also asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names are presented on the screen as members of the Appeal Committee for a term of office of four years. What was the result there? Secretary very General. good result here also of the total number of 205 valid vote cast, 201 voted in favor of the motion and four against the motion. So motion passed, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Uh, then the Congress was asked to approve to elect the persons whose names will be presented on the screen as a chairperson and a deputy chairperson of the appeal committee for a term of office of four years. 
What was the result there? Carlos? Here again, the third person for uh, elected by the Congress as uh, for the uh, appeal, FIFA appeal committee is Mr. Neil Eggleston from United States of America. And the deputy chairperson is Mr. Thomas Bodstrom from Sweden with 157 yes to the motion. So motion passed for both. Thank you very much. And now, following the approval uh, by the Congress under the agenda item 9 to amend the statute to so the effect that the Audit and Compliance Committee and the Governance Committee shall be merged to form a new Governance, Audit and Compliance Committee, an amendment which comes into force immediately. The Congress was asked uh, to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names are presented on the screen as members of the newly created Governance, Audit and Compliance Committee. What was the result? The result of the 206 valid vote cast, 202 voted in favor of the merging of the Audit and Compliance and Governance Committee, while four member associations voted against the motion. So motion well passed, Mr. President. Thank you so much. And then the Congress was also asked to approve the proposal to elect the persons whose names will be presented on the screen as a chairperson and a deputy chairperson of the governor, deputy chairperson of the governance audit and compliance committee. What was the result there, Secretary General? Yes, Mr. Mukul Mud Mudgal from India has been appointed as a chair of the merged governance audit and compliance committee with a large majority of member association, namely 125 voted in favor of him, while the position of deputy chairperson will be occupied by Mr. Chris Min from the United States of America with a total number of votes casted in his favor, estimated at 123. So motion passed for the two positions of chairperson and deputy chairperson of the FIFA Merge Governance Audit and Compliance Committee. Thank you very much. Uh, so this uh, concludes then agenda item uh, 11. And of course, my thanks as uh, FIFA president go to all the members of uh, uh, these bodies and uh, committees uh, who have been elected. Congratulations, those who have not been elected. Thank you for your contributions uh, and uh, stay, of course, with us in football. And uh, we are looking forward, obviously, uh, to uh, having these bodies installed and working as they are part of the life of FIFA. Good. Now, before moving to agenda item 12, which is the closing remarks uh, of the president, uh, we have a request to take the floor by the president of the Finnish Football Association, Mr. Ari Lati, please. Yes, dear Mr. President, dear Chani, dear members of FIFA Council, dear presidents of national associations all over the world, dear friends of football. We, the Nordic Football Associations, wanted to take the floor in this Congress to address FIFA and its member associations about human rights as well as workers' rights in relation to the World Cup 2022 in Qatar. We wanted to draw your attention to these matters because we care about them. We care about human rights. We care about workers' rights. And by we, I mean not only the national associations of Denmark, Faroe Islands, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden, but also our football players, our fans, our people. That is the way our societies are built up, and these rights lie deep in our cultures. We applaud the many leaps forward for workers' rights and conditions in Qatar since being awarded the hosting of the World Cup in December 2010. 
The development is underlined by claim, a claim from uh, uh, ILO, ITUC, and BWI, where all organizations praise developments in Qatar, which are not seen elsewhere in the Gulf region. We are also happy to see FIFA implementing human rights policies across organizations and in FIFA tournaments, respecting the stand on human rights as enshrined in Article 3 of the FIFA statutes. However, the debate, the debate on human and workers' rights in Qatar is as present as ever before. For our Nordic football associations, our primary objective is to ensure the delivery of 2022 FIFA World Cup Qatar in full compliance with human and workers' rights for the thousands of mic migrant workers building the, the World Cup infrastructure and working in different services, transport and hospitality sectors. The current situation for the migrant workers, no matter the improvements already made in Qatar, needs to be improved. This demand is put to us as members of FIFA, and rightly so, by fans, players, commercial partners, media, and so on. This is not a problem. Uh, this is not just a problem for FIFA, nor or Qatar, nor the Nordic football associations alone. It is a matter of utmost importance for the football community across the globe, as our beautiful game shall be the responsible game, proving that the theater of, of the greatest dreams in football can also be the stage of human rights, respect, and anti-discrimination. Since 2016, our six Nordic football associations have been firmly committed to taking responsibility for improving the human and workers' rights situation in Qatar. We would have done so no matter who the host would have been, no matter where the 2022 FIFA World Cup was to take place. We have worked with external experts, trade unions, human rights organizations, and many others on these important issues. We embarked on two visits to Qatar in 2016 and 2019 to engage in a dialogue with Qatari hosts of the Supreme Committee of Delivery and Legacy, the Qatari Football Association, and Qatari authorities. With our own eyes, we have witnessed the efforts and initiatives put in place to improve workers' conditions. But we have also observed and discussed the poor housing conditions, inadequate payment of wages, and lack of access to courts and tribunals for migrant workers. During these visits, we have been asked by the migrant workers in Qatar not to leave them alone. And we will not. In December this year, we plan yet another visit to Qatar, seconded by trade union representatives and human rights organizations. Finally, I want to repeat that we engage in these matters because we care. We care for the human rights situation for the workers in Qatar. We care for the football lovers in the world looking towards the World Cup 2022 as a beacon, beacon of joy. We care for the football community and we want to take seriously our responsibility also in this respect when organizing the FIFA tournaments. And we care for the legacy left in Qatar after the final whistle is blown next year. And I want to believe that we, in this case, means all of us. Thank you. Kitos, Harry, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, to you, uh, also on behalf of the Nordic uh, associations. Uh, for your remarks, uh, I think I mentioned this particular topic as well in my address earlier on. It is a priority for FIFA. It is a priority for Qatar as well, and you have been witnessing it. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the World Cup will be the best ever World Cup, but uh, it will also be a World Cup which leaves a real social legacy in Qatar and in the region. And uh, we are comforted in saying this by, of course, the many uh, expressions of support received from 
international trade unions and other organizations. But as you say, because we care and we all care, we continue and we focus on uh, protecting human rights and uh, uh, defending human rights, not only in Qatar, but actually all over, all over the world. So we work together. We will be happy to welcome you in December in, uh, in Qatar. The weather is very, very nice then, and uh, you will see that uh, playing conditions uh, are great uh, uh, as well. And uh, in the uh, December period, there is the FIFA Arab Cup being played in Qatar, so maybe you can go and uh, uh, also watch some of the games and see if the Arab teams or the Nordic teams are better. Maybe we can do a tournament once, joining Nordics and Arabs, and then we see what comes out there. Thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, I'm just looking again into the room to see if anybody else would like to take the floor. This is not the case, uh, so I would like to come to the conclusion of uh, this Congress. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for uh, your participation, not only at the Congress, but throughout the years, throughout the difficult year. I hope uh, that I can count on all of you, because all of you are FIFA, to develop all these exciting projects that we have in the pipeline, because we will need you to do that. I thank you as well for uh, your patience, for staying with us the last, uh, I don't know, couple of hours. I wish you all the very best, the healthy summer. I wish the very best of luck uh, to UEFA for the Euro, to uh, Comnebol for the Copa America, to CONCACAF for uh, the Gold Cup, to all of us for the Olympic Games, and in particular, of course, the Olympic football tournament. Then we'll have beach soccer coming up in Russia and uh, futsal in Lithuania. So a few things are going on in the next few months. And I'm sure a few of us will have the chance to meet, to strategize, and to make football truly global. Thank you very much. The Congress, the 71st FIFA Congress, today on 21st of uh, May, FIFA birthday, by the way, is closed. Thank you.